Well, good Friday morning. Bruce Williams here. Being as it's Friday, let's get back on the Growth Path Challenge track after my absence for the last week. And this is Growth Path Challenge number 11. Uh, in this challenge, we're going to go back and, and catch the last 10 images from the 2008 Growth Path Review mock exam. Many of these images are freely available today in NOAA's archive. So if you're interested, take a quick look through that database and see if you can find it in there. Okay, question number one. This is tissue from a cat. I would like a morphologic diagnosis and a cause. Okay, hopefully you've given yourself about a minute to come up with the answer for this one. Um, this is a cat with multiple sort of gelatinous nodules within the cerebrum affecting both the gray and the white matter. The morphologic diagnosis would be multifocal granulomatous or pyogranulomatous encephalitis. And the cause is Cryptococcus neoformans. Okay, if you wanted to go as far as to say variant Gaudia, Grubia, or something like that, but Cryptococcus neoformans would be a perfectly acceptable answer. Uh, this, this is a, uh, a dimorphic fungus, which is seen throughout the world. Much of the world is uh, spared. The other three dimorphic fungi, which we're very familiar with here in the United States, particularly Histoplasma capsulatum, Blastomyces dermatitidis, and coccidio, uh, coccidioides imidis, or daisyposii. Um, and But you can find Cryptococcus pretty much anywhere in the world. Um, the morphologic diagnosis of granulomatous encephalitis is a little bit of a misnomer. Uh, yes, we will use the term granulomatous because the dimorphic fungi do generally stimulate a uh, uh, a granulomatous or pyogranulomatous response, but cryptococcus because of the uh, mucinous capsule that is produced often uh, engenders much less of a response um, than the other dimorphic fungi. And so if you take a histologic section of one of these nodules, you'll see rather a soap bubble appearance um, where the septa of soap bubbles are probably the the very thin tendrils of neoplasm of a few macrophages that are there. A lot of people say there's no inflammation at all. I think there always is some inflammation in these nodules. And, you know, it's very difficult to put a morphologic diagnosis on something if you're not allowed to say um, that there is inflammation. So I have traditionally gone with granulomatous encephalitis. Um, this probably, well, it could arise through hematogenous infection, and you would see... Uh, colonies of cryptococcus in other organs, uh, the lung, uh, some of the parenchymal organs. A lot of these cases will arise through uh, inhalation of the, uh, of the agent passage through the cribriform plate. Um, the presence of, of cryptococcus has been traditionally associated with immunosuppressed animals, especially those with feline leukemia. Um, and and Cryptococcal nodules within the brain, also known as cryptococcomas, are commonly seen in uh, humans infected with the HIV virus. Severely uh, immunodeficient humans without uh, appropriate cell media immunity. The horse also um, has a predilection for developing uh, cryptococcus in the brain. So, that is number one. How about we move on? Question number two, is tissue from a cinemologous macaque? Can you give me the cause? Okay, time's up. We are looking at the abdomen of this cinemologous monkey. And it looks like there's a lot of spaghetti in here. Now, this cino has very little fat stores. Okay, the yellow material that we're seeing, which has the blood vessels, is probably the, uh, 
uh, mesentery and omentum, so not a lot of fat going on there. So this is normal, this sort of orange red material. It's this white spaghetti looking material that is the abnormal part. Those are phalarid parasites. Those are adults living free in the abdominal cavity. They're not causing much of a problem at all. And uh, in Cinemalgus and other old world primates, they would probably be the filarial parasite Edison filaria malayensis. Uh, New world primates um, have a couple of filarial parasites including dipetalanema, which is sort of a ubiquitous uh, one that's seen all over the world, and a oncocircuit parasite called molanema. molanema. Um, these type of parasites uh, are seen in a number of species. There's uh, Ceteria in deer, one of my favorite uh, nematodes, Ceteria yehi. Um, and they don't really cause much of a problem at all. No peritonitis. They're very well host adapted, and they just sort of hang out in there. And uh, enough said about them. Slide number three is tissue from a pig. I would like for you to give me a morphologic diagnosis to name this condition and also a likely cause. Okay, time's up. We are looking at the liver from a distance. We can see large areas of necrosis and loss within the paddock parenchyma. There is no fibrosis at this point. So the most common condition associated with this presentation in probably young pigs is going to be a condition known as hepatosis dietetica. And this results from a imbalance in vitamin E and selenium. Sometimes it's not enough selenium, sometimes it's not enough vitamin E, and I just eventually, because it, it's different in different parts of the world, um, I just have gone with vitamin E selenium imbalance. Um, both of these are very potent antioxidants, um, and they manifest in a number of ways in pigs. One of the ways they do in younger pigs is massive necrosis. So this is multifocal to coalescing, massive hepatic necrosis. When I say massive, it's not a tremendous amount of necrosis. It's a particular histologic pattern of necrosis which affects all parts of the lobules. Various toxins um, tend to affect certain parts of the lobules. The ones that have to be uh, uh, biologically changed to become an active toxin, that usually happens in the central lobular area or the mid-zonal area of the, uh, the tumor. So it's the necrosis and the necrotizing effects of the toxin generally hit those areas. Extremely potent toxins like phosphorus in high doses, um, it will affect the paraportal areas because that's where the blood supply first comes into the liver and it is such a potent toxin it's just going to hit the first cells it sees and those are periportal. There are only a couple of, of toxins like this. Um, but this is, uh, this is one that will affect all parts of the lobule and it's fairly characteristic. Um, there are a couple of other potential toxins that you could use in this particular case. Uh, coal tar, phenol, uh, clay pigeon, things like that um, are in the literature, but I would certainly know the pathogenesis of hepatosis dietetica um, and the various conditions that it will cause in pigs. Or, excuse me, vitamin E selenium deficiency and the conditions that it causes in pigs. You may see lesions in the skeletal muscles. You may see an exudative diesthesis. So a number of things with hepatosis dietetica being one of the more common and the uh, ones with the highest mortality. Okay, slide number four, classic slide. I think you can find this one in Noah's archive with no problem. And this is tissue from a rabbit. I would like for you to give, you a, give me a morphologic diagnosis and a cause. Okay, your time is up. We're looking at cross-section of the liver. And what we're seeing, we see these sort of linear structures that are replacing large areas 
of the hepatic parenchyma. They are white. We know that something's been added. Okay, so what we're looking at, these sort of branched, tortuous channels, are the bile ducts, which you normally shouldn't see or barely be able to see in the normal preparation. These are just absolutely markedly dilated. They are white. They are fibrotic. Um, and you can see the cavitations. They are still patent, but this white crumbly material within them is a tremendous proliferation of the uh, mucosal lining of these bile ducts, of the biliary epithelium. It forms you know, fronds, and within the biliary epithelium, we're going to find a causative agent, which is a coccidian, which is seen in young rabbits, usually at the age of weaning, known as Imeria steadae. This is a disease of young rabbits. Uh, many of them that are uh, just raised as pets may have them. You'll see large numbers of uh, oocysts within the feces. Um, if you take a section through here, what you're going to see is just florid proliferation of the epithelium. You'll see lymphoplasmacytic uh, inflammation. And then within the epithelium, you'll see large numbers of coccidial schizonts and gametocytes with oocysts in the lumen. Uh, the morphologic diagnosis based on all of that, the one that I've used over the years, is a diffuse proliferative and lymphoplasmacytic cholangitis proliferation, um, which uh, comments on the marked proliferation of the mucosa. If you want to throw chronic in there, that would certainly be uh, uh, appropriate, and that would comment to the fibrosis. So maybe even a better one would be multifocal coalescing, chronic proliferative and lymphoplasmacytic cholangitis. <coughs> I said before, this is a disease in which uh, uh, disease and death is primarily seen in young rabbits. Once you get to a certain age, um, you are probably uh, have immunity to this particular uh, condition. But young rabbits, you can have such fluid proliferation here and loss of hepatic parenchyma, they can actually end up in hepatic failure. Slide number five. Staying with the rabbits and lagomorphs, this is a hamster. This hamster is obviously seen better days. What I would like for you to do is to give me a morphologic diagnosis and a cause. Okay, this is a condition that uh, is still out there. Uh, I thought it was a historical condition, but I seem to get one or two a year of these. And these are, this is an adult hamster with multiple trichoepitheliomas. And the cause is hamster polyomavirus. This is a very, very interesting condition in hamsters. Um, there was a fellow a number of years ago who was raising hamsters, had about 4,000 hamsters. And he noticed that the young hamsters, shortly after birth, uh, and within up to 16 weeks, developed a, uh, a case of lymphoma, which affected about 25% of the crop every time that he would have a large number of births. 25% of the young animals um, would have full-blown uh, lymphoma, often arise in, in the mesenteric lymph nodes, in the spleen with massive numbers of circulating neoplastic uh, lymphocytes within the, uh, uh, within the blood vessels. Um, but they never could, uh, never was able to culture virus. They were uh, sterile in terms of virus. They were not productive um, in terms of the virus. A significant percentage of the adult animals, not the young ones, but the adult animals would develop these follicular, primitive follicular tumors, um, which from which the virus could be cultured. And it turned out to be a hamster polyoma virus, and that, uh, that facility shut down many, many years ago, but the polyoma virus is still out there, and you will occasionally see both cutaneous forms and the, uh, uh, the in young animals, you will see uh, lymphoma due to hamster polyoma virus. Very interesting lesion. Uh, interesting condition in the hamster. Okay. Slide number six, also from Noah's archive, is tissue from a dog. Can I have a morphologic diagnosis? 
and two, clinical pathologic abnormalities. So uh, that's something that you would see in the clin path. Don't tell me uh, uh, that he's got uh, swollen cheeks. That's not clinical pathologic abnormalities. Want something in the blood work? Okay. People puzzle over this sometimes. After we talk about it, hopefully you won't. Morphologic diagnosis that I am looking for is something along the lines of bilateral maxillary fibrous osteodystrophy with hemorrhage. Now when we think about the bones of the face, especially maxilla, they should be much shorter or smaller or of, of a, a smaller diameter than this. And these are bright red because um, normally with the bone you tend not to see the, the vasculature as much. Um, if we didn't cut through it, probably it would still look white, but we have cut through it. And because the majority of this bone has been resorbed and has been replaced by fibrovascular tissue, we get this very hemorrhagic appearance. Um, this is fibrous osteodystrophy. Most likely cause in a young dog is going to be a diet that has a significant imbalance of calcium and phosphorus, probably a high meat diet with high levels of phosphorus but low levels of calcium. And your body needs calcium for quite a number of metabolic conditions, including you know, keeping your heart beating and muscle contraction um, and just homeostasis. If your calcium gets too low, you know, everything goes, sort of goes haywire. So it is going to, if you're not getting enough calcium in your diet, it is going to take it out of your bones. Uh, you will get uh, stimulation of the parathyroid glands, release of parathyroid hormone, and its various effects around the body uh, in the kidney to resorb as much calcium as possible and to activate osteoclasts to start chewing away at the bone and mobilizing that calcium to preserve it for the rest of the body because bones are the storehouse. In dogs and in non-human primates, especially New World monkeys, one of the uh, primary uh, and first bones to be affected, and ones that is affected most obviously and worst, are the bones of the face, the bones of the jaws. And, and so what we're looking here is a good case of fibrous osteodystrophy. And in a young animal, it's going to be dietary related. In an older animal, um, it will be the result of chronic renal failure and the inability um, to excrete phosphorus and phosphorus. Generally, it's a phosphorus problem. The phosphorus gets high. Calcium will, uh, will become low in response. Okay, how about slide number seven? Slide number seven is an ox. I would like to have a morphologic diagnosis. Name the condition and give me three possible causes. Okay, hopefully you gave yourself about 90 seconds for that one. A little bit more of a complex question. And when we look at this particular uh, section of cerebrum with a little bit of cerebellum and back, um, I hope that you notice that the cerebrum is smaller. The gyri are narrower. The sulci are deeper. The whole thing appears somewhat yellow. It almost looks like it's melting. Okay. And this is a condition which is known as polioencephalomalacia, which is not a bad morphologic diagnosis. Um, polio meaning uh, gray matter and uh, cephalo being referring to the brain and malacia being necrosis. Morphologic diagnosis would be uh, multifocal to uh, coalescing. Laminar necrosis of the cerebral gray matter which is where it usually happens. And three possible causes, the most common are thiamine deficiency, not because the animal is getting, not getting enough thiamine because the ruminal bacteria and microorganisms will produce plenty of thiamine, but usually there's something in there that's binding it, um, which may, might be uh, something uh, plant like uh, bracken fern, which commonly uh, produces a thiaminase, which um, will cause that certain microorganisms if they overgrow, will cause damage to the produced thiamine, 
Um, so something is causing a decreased level of thiamine. Uh, the second thing would be a high sulfur diet. Perhaps the animals are being fed uh, uh, sulfated foods, and the ruminal microorganisms will take uh, sulfur in the rumen and will convert it to a highly toxic hydrogen sulfide. Uh, and finally, lead toxicosis is another thing that will cause this. Other things that may cause laminar necrosis um, in in cattle, much more commonly in pigs, but in cattle you can see uh, salt toxicosis, really primary or secondary salt toxicosis causing laminar necrosis in the brain, not usually causing a good gross lesion like this. And, and some diets that have high levels of molasses for some reason may do that. But I would go with the classics, thiamine deficiency, lead toxicity, and a high sulfur diet. Okay, slide number eight is tissue from a rat. I would like a morphologic diagnosis. <coughs> this is a quick one, 45 seconds, 30 seconds, 15 seconds. You should get this one. This is obviously testis from a rat. And if you look through the vaginal tunics, these vessels are within the vaginal tunics. You look through them, you see these large white coalescent areas. And this even in the unopened testis is going to be an interstitial cell tumor. The tumors tend to be yellow. They tend to be a bit hemorrhagic. They are producing steroids. They are very common in, uh, in laboratory rats. Um, one of the major causes that uh, one of the nicer strains of rats is rarely used in research today, the Fisher 344, because they have a very high incidence of interstitial cell tumors, mesothelioma, and mononuclear cell leukemia. And basically, people sort of stopped using them, even though they were a strain that would rarely bite you. But interstitial cell tumors are still one of the most common neoplasms in rats. Um, you also see uh, interstitial cell hyperplasia from time to time. Um, but these changes are not uncommon in many of the commonly used strains of rats, including sprayed dollies. And if you're working with rats, you're going to see them in the older males. Slide number nine is tissue from a horse. Let's make this easy and just name the condition. Okay, your time's up. We have cross-section through the... Uh, Skull at the back end, getting close to the cribriform plate. We're looking at some of the uh, ethmoid turbinates, and there is unilaterally a large area of hemorrhage. Um, it seems to be disturbing the uh, nasal bone here and pushing it from side to side, um, and there may be some lysis of the turbinates. This is a condition known as a progressive ethmoid hematoma. Um, these are polypoid masses of inflammation, primarily granulomas, which contain tremendous amounts of blood breakdown pigments in the form of hemosiderin and uh, hematoidin. Hematoidin is extracellular hemosiderin. It tends to be bright yellow. And in this particular condition will form absolutely beautiful formations, which are known as seroid sequins. Um, these, uh, it's not sure exactly how these start. They tend to be uh, just areas of recurrent hemorrhage, which distort the uh, the mucosa ultimately can result in lysis in the uh, bones of the nasal cavity, uh, sinuses, and even the, uh, uh, even the face. They can be lytic in nature. And uh, somebody years ago um, came up with a great idea of how to stop the bleeding. You just inject it with uh, formalin. Formalin is a great anticoagulant, but if you ever got it in a cut, it just burns like the Dickens. And, uh, yeah, that worked well a couple times until they injected one that, that uh, communicated with the brain through uh, the ulcerated uh, uh, cribriform plate, and they partially fixed the animal's brain. So nowadays I think these are probably lasered off. They're not uh, very carefully. They're not, uh, uh, if they're treated, they don't inject them with formalin anymore. A lot of them may be incidental findings. So you just sort of pick it up where the history is that the animal is old and it's sort of stertorous and and you'll see this. So this is a progressive ethmoid hematoma. Okay, our last slide for today is going to be tissue from an ox or several ox here. 
I would like for you to name the condition, name the cause, and give me a breed that might have this particular condition. Okay, time's up. These cattle are called double-muscled cattle or doppelganger cattle, and they suffer from a congenital deficiency of myostatin. It's a mutation in the myostatin gene, um, and myostatin is actually a, uh, a gene product which causes the muscles to stop growing. Okay? And you don't have that, so your muscles don't stop growing. Um, this is characteristically seen in the Belgian blue cattle, but you can see this in a number of other breeds, including uh, Santa Catrudis or Charolais or the Piedmont, Piedmontese cattle. But I think Belgian blue are the ones that characteristically have that. And you think, well, this is great. you got a, uh, a cow that's going to have twice as many steaks and twice as much meat and all that. Well, it sounds great on paper. Okay, The problem is the same problem that we see with uh, people who spend a lot of time in the gym. When you have this tremendous amount of muscle production, the thing is you do not have this, this support stroma, the fibrous connective tissue, to support it. So these animals tend to get injured. Um, weightlifters in the gym, they you know spend a lot of time with heavy weights, and they they really cause hypertrophy of the uh, uh, of the muscle fibers. But the fibrous connective tissue that supports it, the vasculature that supports it, really doesn't become hypertrophic. So you end up with a lot of torn muscles, a lot of injuries. Same things will happen to these cattle. They have some trouble breeding. Um, and they do tend to injure a lot. Um, the other issue with, uh, with this particular condition is something else that doesn't uh, become hypertrophied is fat. The, this muscle is very lean and as such may not have the taste or the texture that uh, people are used to when you get a really nice juicy steak. There's not as much juice to these. So uh, a great uh, idea on paper, this spontaneous genetic defect, but probably uh, one that uh, doesn't really uh, yield all that much benefit in terms of beef production. Okay, well, like I always say, this sure did uh, seem like a good idea at the time, taking a gross path challenge on Friday. We're going to continue to do that. People seem to enjoy this. So we'll be back next Friday with another gross path challenge. And I thought, or I, I hope that you had a good time today, and uh, I look forward to seeing you again next Friday.